I do not think they would believe that I am misrepresenting the evidence at all. Right. Um, you know, and one of the questions would always be if somebody is being quoted, are they being correctly represented? Are you accurately representing the archaeology or misrepresenting something or twisting it? And I don't think anyone would find anything in there that's misrepresenting history. Uh, because everything that's there is coming from the experts that are not LDS uh, and saying, you know, here's what they're saying. Here's how from a Book of Mormon lens, you can see how that fits into the text. Mormonism with the Murph. We're already seeing explorers church history on the church's truth claims. Okay, I want to ask you a few questions pushing back or some criticisms to Mesoamerican okay. geography. Um, and this might come either from people who hold a different geographical model or just critics who don't believe the Book of Mormon's historical. Uh, so I think the first uh, elephant in the room to address as we look at the map is it talks about land northward, land southward. But someone's probably looking at this going, hold on a wee minute. Land northward <laughs> is more like uh, south or west or northwest. Land southward is more east, southeast. So you're kind of having to like, you know, it, it doesn't. It's not facing the right directions. Uh, and you addressed that in your book. What would be your response to that? The way people conceive directions is culture bound. Uh, and we don't understand that because our culture is sufficiently pervasive that we assume that, of course, everybody thinks the way we do. And so every, you know, we all know that North is straight up and down, uh, or you know, straight up and South is straight down and east and west, and you've got the little compass on the right-hand side here that's, that tells you that. And it says, yep, this is, this is the way it is. That's not necessarily the way other people will conceive the world or directions. Uh, there's a really fascinating one where the, uh, I think it's a Tzaltal people. The Tzaltal people orient their world according to this particular mountain. And they talk about things being upslope or downslope. So you don't go north, south, east, or west. You go up slope or down slope. And, you know, so the words they use depend on, you know, how you conceive uh, the area. Well, we conceive it as four quadrants that are based on this vertical and horizontal. The Mesoamerican people also had four quadrants, and they actually considered the world divided into five uh, because the fifth was the center. So when things crossed, the center was also a place. Um, so they had you know, five conceptual things, but we have four anyway. But they will talk about the four quarters of the world, the, the quarters in these, the, in these regions. But instead of looking at them with the vertical and the horizontal, they had a, like an x-axis that followed the course of the sun. So everything will happen based on the travel of the sun from the east to the west. And that moves over the year. So the sun will appear on the horizon in different places, but east is always that range of places where the sun rises. So even though it changes, it rises in this arc. And so what happens is you get this X where you know north is everything to the right of the sun. So if you get an east-west axis defined by the sun, where the sun rises, everything is uh, to the east is, let's say, to the right hand of that. Uh, and it'll depend on, in, in the Maya world, which way you face. Do you face the sun or is your back to the sun? So sometimes some cultures will say it's the left, some say it's the right. But the idea is, you know, it's this range of things. It's not just the strict north. Well, the other thing you have to realize is everything happens in directions based on where you're standing at the time. So what is considered north when I'm, you know, if you're looking at that x-axis, what's north, east, and west will shift if I move from Nephi up to perhaps Bountiful. Uh, so those things will alter. But what gets caught in the arc is therefore north. And with the east-west axis, uh, those things get caught in the arc. And so north makes more sense. <coughs> Some of it is also perceptual geography. We forget that these people don't have maps like we do. So we look at this map and we go, oh, I can see obvious things. They never had that vision. They, they didn't know. Um, yeah, and you don't get world maps. And everything is based on the ground. 
And I remember talking to John Sorensen, or not John Sorensen, John Clark, the archaeologist. And I said, well, what do you think about this odd skewing of where North and South is? And he says, well, he says, it's happened to me when I've been down there. And he says, I get down there and, and where my perception of North is will shift based on where I am. Hmm. So there's lots of things that go into it, but basically it's culture bound. And what I found in the Book of Mormon is that even though it's translation literature and we get north, south, east, and west, and we perceive them that way, the distances and directions seem to all be based on from the east to the west. And that seems to be the foundation in the Book of Mormon. So the language of the Book of Mormon as translated from the east to the west appears to replicate the way that the people in this world saw their directions, which is the path of the sun, which is gonna change in this arc. And then north is to the right hand and south to the to the left or you know, flipped around. Okay, that's interesting. So so to them, to the, the Nephites and Lamanites, uh, for example, land northward to their perception, they would have perceived it as that is the land north, and they would have perceived that's the land yeah. south, even though to us we can see it looks more west and east. Yes. Yeah, and it, it all has to do with their perception, not ours. And I don't, I don't know if I told this story in the book or not, but a friend of mine went to uh, Manila uh, on a, uh, a mission and he was speaking with one of the natives and he said, I needed to tell this, na this native of Manila who'd lived there all his life, I needed to tell him how to get to a place he had not been before. And he said, he knew the city really well. So I got out a map to show him where this place was. And the guy's looking at this map going, I don't know what this is. I, I don't understand. And he said, so I had to explain to him, pretend you're a bird flying over the streets of Manila. And this is what you would see if you're a bird. He's going, oh, okay. It was a perception that had never even occurred to him. Hmm. So this is a modern man. This happened 15, 20 years ago, where you have a modern person who is living and driving cars in Manila and does not have the understanding of what a map would be. Um, so think about the ancient world that doesn't even have maps and nothing like that. Everything is based on what their perception is from the ground. Gotcha. Um, another common criticism, and this one, I actually did a recent video on it, so I kind of addressed it for uh, most of my listeners, but I'll ask it to you. Um, so the hill Kimura we have would be up here, but people will say, well, don't know we met. Uh, Mer and I you know, buried the plates at the hill Kimura, but that was up in New York. So there are two hill Kimuras. How can the hill Kimura be down in Mesoamerica? Uh, what's your response to that? We'll start with the common assumption that the plates were buried in the Hill Cumora, because we always say that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, the plates were buried. In the, they weren't. You go to the text and Mormon says, I buried all of these plates in the Hill Cumora, except the ones I gave to my son. That's right. Okay. So the plates that Joseph Smith had, as far as we know from the Book of Mormon itself, were not buried in Camorra. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where were they buried? You know, somewhere else. But, you know, for all we know, they weren't buried in Camorra. They certainly weren't at that time period. So we know that Moroni has them and he leaves, and, and we know he leaves Camorra. You know, he leaves that land. He flees from the uh, Lamanites, doesn't he? Because they're trying to, you know, go out trying to Kimura. kill him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the place where he says, I got to get out of here. These people are trying to kill me. And he doesn't go south because south is where more of these people are. And so apparently he goes north. Um, so, yeah, he could have walked it. And John Sorensen found an account of someone who actually had walked that entire uh, uh, timeline. So it, it could have happened. So the first thing is, you know, they weren't there. And second then is, you know, well, you know, they're in this hill in New York. And because... The Book of Mormon says plates were buried in the hill. It gets named Camorra. Well, nobody names it Camorra contemporaneously. Joseph doesn't even use that language mm -hmm. until much later. Uh, it appears that uh, that uh, Oliver Cowdery is the one who makes that connection, and probably based on that verse, and therefore erroneously. And so he starts misreading the hill. Yeah, uh, Camorra. And it becomes tradition. And once it's tradition, what's truth, right? Right. Um, so it is absolutely true that the plates were taken out of the hill in New York that is called that we have called Camorra. 
there is no reason to believe that that hill is the one that uh, on which the Nephites and the Jaredites were all killed off. Uh, the, you know, there's no textual reason to believe that. Yeah, but uh, it's not the same hill, the one in New York where yeah. the final battle happened for the Nephites and the Jaredites. And, and would you say, because certainly I, I would have grown up uh, believe, believing that the Hill Camorra in New York was the still same Hill Camorra where the final battle happened. Would you yeah, say that, you. you know, Joseph Smith and probably other church leaders, that was just there, you know, if there's other people who were saying that, that sort of became the tradition and that they just believed it without critically looking at the text or by revelation, but that was just the, the understanding. Oh, and they, yeah, I mean, when, when you look at what the early saints believed about the geography of the Book of Mormon, it was very clearly hemispheric. They believed yes. that this was the explanation for every Native American everywhere. Um, and so it didn't matter where there was a Native American, they had to be part of the Book of Mormon. So they immediately interpreted it according to their own world, which is logical. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, they weren't terribly critical about it. When they finally had the chance to get critical and they get in Utah and people start having conferences about Book of Mormon geography, that's when things change dramatically. Uh, and people are moving away from both the hemispheric and the North American and trying to find other places because they're finding that, that you know, those things did not, fit as well as they would have liked them to mm. and it's funny you would think if joe smith if he's the author and if he's the one creating this text that if he if he talks if he writes specifically that mormon buries the plates ink more except the ones which he gives to his son moroni uh you would think that he wouldn't accept then the the tradition of the final battle happening in new york if he was the author but you might be able to understand it if he's uh, the translator as well as like many of us who've read it and not, yeah. not really noticed. And, and that's an important thing. You know, everybody assumes that Joseph knew everything about the Book of Mormon and he knew everything about where it took place and how things happened. And it's true that he had visions about them. Um, but that doesn't mean that he really understood everything. He was, he was the translator. Uh, he learned enough to be able to translate. Um, but he wasn't the author. He didn't know every single detail inside and out and why it happened and where. Um, there was an interesting test I saw somewhere on the internet and I'd love to see it and take it again and, and have other people take it who were talking about geography and what Joseph knew. Because what they did is they pulled up a picture and they said, where is this? So here's a picture of somewhere in the world. Where do you think <laughs> this is? It's fine. And, I am... Um... Uh, I, I went to this um this place in Belfast. I don't know if you've seen some it's like um the Crystal Maze. Uh that's kind of like a UK TV show. But you basically when there's different puzzles, some are like physical challenges, some are mental. And there was one uh, where it was like a picture of a place would come up on the screen, and then we would have to find and um, you know, press what country, what city. Yeah, yeah. And it, it yeah, was hard. It, it is hard. It's difficult. Yeah. You know, the very fact that you see it doesn't mean you know where it is. Mm -hmm. And you can have every detail about it, but you don't know where it's located. And if Joseph is getting a vision, having a vision does not mean you know where it's located. Just like seeing that picture does not allow you all the time. And, you know, sometimes you go, oh, yeah, I've seen a picture of that before. I recognize that. Uh, so sometimes you'll catch it. But a lot of times you're going, no clue. Yeah. You know, yep, I can see the picture. I can describe it. No clue where this thing is. And so when you say Joseph had a vision, sure, he had a vision. Did that mean he knew the geography? No way. Mm. And something I've thought about as well is, so I, I don't think we know for sure what Joseph believed about geography, but I, I assume he might have embraced more of a hemisphere view oh, yeah. of, of geography. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he did because he was willing to accept any evidence from anywhere. Yeah. But it's interesting when it talks about like the distances traveled between cities when you know scholars have looked yeah, at it, they've realized yeah, it. Yeah. It, no, nobody was that critical until, shoot, is it 1880s, 1880s to 1920s, somewhere in there. Uh, mm -hmm. They finally start getting people who are much more serious about this and, and start looking at it. And that's when you start to get people saying, oh, I need to have a, um, 
a symbolic representation. So I, you know, not trying to put it on the map, but I'm just gonna try and put the things together so they link. So that's where you get the hourglass pictures and you know, a whole bunch of other things where I said, okay, yeah, all we can tell is, you know, there's a river here and this is, and you get these very blocky because they're not trying to put it on the real world. They're just saying, here's what the Book of Mormon says. Now, if we understand that, how do we make it fit to the real world? But you're just starting to get that idea, uh, you know, right around the turn of the century, uh, the ninth, uh, yeah, 20th century, 1900s. Yeah. And, and like if Joseph Hard Smith people is... People like me to remember we've turned another century, so... <laughs> And like again, if, if Joseph Smith is is the author and he's a creative genius and he has in his mind the, the map for the Book of Mormon being, you know, North, Central, South America, hemispheric geography, you would think he would know it would take like more than 20 days to go from you know, like north to south. Like I almost feel like that almost works in his favor a little bit. Like, because you would think if, if he's talking about how long it takes to go to certain places, there's no way that could be in a hemispheric geography and you would think he would know that if he was the author but as the translator you again may not have picked up on those yeah, things good point good point okay one one last criticism is uh and we we touched on this briefly i think in our last episode but metallurgy a lack of metallurgy in uh mesoamerica you know it being an anachronism and yeah i know john Sorensen, you know I, I remember I did a, a video on anachronisms and he talked about how he has like lots of little pieces of metals, but he doesn't believe archaeologists would uh, support it, would, would verify uh, metallurgy during Book of Mormon time periods. What would be your response to metallurgy sort of uh, invalidating yeah, or undermining Mesoamerica? Yeah, of, of all of the things there are in the Book of Mormon, I've got you know really good answers for everything except metallurgy. Metallurgy is the one thing where I'm saying, yeah, got to wait on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, the thing you should say also say about that is we're not talking about metallurgy at all. We're talking about metallurgy at the appropriate time period. So metallurgy is, uh, is used around this area. Uh, Tumbaga is actually being used and produced in Northern South America at the correct time period. There are people there who are making uh, uh, various ornaments and things out of Tumbaga. So the technology is not all that far away, uh, other than you've got to go through Panama, you know, to get there. But there are some indications that there's some trade routes that go there. There should be, you know, coastal trade. So it's not totally inconceivable. Um, so we know that, that it existed at the time period we just haven't found the evidence that people were doing it at that time. So, you know, people knew about metals. Uh, there are metal workers that are happening during the right time period that are in South America within trade rate, uh, trade route range of that area. We just haven't found the uh, places of production. Now, one of the other things is, you know, Tumbaga is, you know, partially gold. And we know that the the Spaniards did the best they could to strip the anything that was gold from this world. Uh, so there may have been things, you know, artifacts that we would have found that they found and you know got rid of. What we also haven't found is the production methods. So you you should see a slag heap, or you should see um, you know some indication of of the process, and they haven't found forges that may or may not be related to you know looking in the right places but it it clearly was not a dominant technology uh in this time period okay now, my hypothesis is that's one of the reasons why uh the nephites actually were able to attract a society and to build a society is that they were producing metalwork at a time that nobody else was and therefore they had trade goods that people wanted and if you have trade goods that people want uh, and a method that they don't know to do it, you keep it secret as much as you can and you try to keep it away from them, much as China tried to preserve the silk trade and not let people know how it was made for a long time. Uh, and so I, that's my explanation. That's an explanation based on absence. And one of these days they'll find one and they'll say, aha, see, now we know it was there. And I'll say, okay, I was wrong, it was there. But 
Yeah, that's my guess as to why we're not finding it. I think the Nephites tried to keep it to themselves. Right. And and in the Book of Mormon, do, at what point does it talk about metallurgy? You know, like uh, iron, steel. Is it more at the beginning of the Book of Mormon when the Nephites are in the land of Nephi, so Highland, Guatemala, or is it throughout the Book of Mormon? Yeah, you'll get, I mean, you get comments throughout. Uh, you'll get comments about steel and the Jaredites, which is, again, anachronistic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect that in, in many of the cases, we're, we're getting language translation issues, uh, just like uh, you get in the Bible for brass and bronze and you know other kinds of metals where the wrong term is used as sort of a collective term. So I think some of that's translation issues. Okay. But yeah, th there, there is no indication of metallurgy during Book of Mormon times in this area. Right. Okay. Outstanding anachronism. And so, yeah, that one, that, that one is my last remaining holdout where I'm saying, yep, I've, I've got to bow down to archaeology on this one and, and say, yeah, don't, don't have much on that. Well, I appreciate your intellectual honesty and uh, consistency there. <laughs> hey, you got to do it. If you're not intellectually honest about what you missed, nobody will trust you and what you found. So yeah, that's it. Uh, I appreciate it in your book as well. When you talk about, I guess, says name on Fatsal Kulat or Harvard's oh, pronounced. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nobody and, pronounces I, that one correctly. I, I yeah. had to teach my family. My family and I are about the only ones that pronounce it. It's called Quetzal Kulat. Kulat. I would always say Quetzal Kudal, but, uh, yeah, how that's not yeah. really a, a strong uh, evidence, you know, connecting Quetzalcoatl to, you know, to Jesus, you know, the, the white yeah. God. It, the traditionally, we've used it. We, we've said that this is a connection. The great white God and Quetzalcoatl are represented. It's, it's all made up. It's based on, based on our misinterpretation of Spanish mission, misinterpretation of native legend. Yeah. So you know, we're, we're too, uh, two metamorphoses away you know, where <laughs> people have just changed things just slightly and reinterpreted them and then we find the reinterpreted ones and we reinterpret those to make it look like what we want uh, but when you get back to reconstructing what the native belief was there's no connection whatsoever okay let's just talk for a couple of minutes uh before we wrap up in part one about the heartland i think that's the, that's the i think other main geographical model i know there's a few others but that's probably the only other main more serious that's the most po yeah that one is yeah. rapidly becoming the most popular and it's the most popular for a couple of reasons uh, one is it allows people to to say yeah our tradition is correct um, the other thing it allows them to do is say doggone it we're in the united states and this thing happened in the united states and therefore uh, you know, all of the Nephites are us, and that's a good thing. Very patriotic. Um, very patriotic, and and it kind of gets mixed up in that. Um, it's a it's a process that has happened before, um, and now I'm trying to remember the article, but uh, an LDS folklorist had you know looked at the way people sort of reinterpreted the land um, when they went west, and sort of reinterpreted. It so that it fit into Book of Mormon history. Sort of like, you know, we, we will recreate Book of Mormon history where we are uh, mm -hmm. so that we have our, you know, our land, our Utah land becomes tied to the Book of Mormon. And, and it happens, of course, in names like Manti and Nephi. And, you know, these are cities in Utah. Yeah, named after uh, the so, Book of Mormon. Well, and the River Jordan is, you know, so they sacralize their land by linking it to the text. Mm -hmm. And so that, that impetus to want to do that is there. Uh, it's also driven by some really interesting misreading of scripture um, where they talk about, you know, promised land. Well, obviously the promised land has to be a really cool place like the United States, obviously. Um, uh, they interpret it ex exclusive to the United States, not all the Americas. Yeah, I mean, these are some of these ideas behind it. And, and what they forget is when it's promised that you're going to have a land that's better than any other land. The promise goes to the Jaredites, promise goes to the Nephites. And the, the Nephites are the newer ones at 600 BC. So if you're going to come to the new world and you're promised to come into a really cool place where there's a great civilization in 600 BC, 
you're going to find it in Mesoamerica. You're not going to find it in North America. North America, 600 BC, you're still small tribes hunting. I mean, they got some really cool forests. Uh, I mean, lots of forests are around. Um, but there aren't very many people. It's spread out. Um, it's just not a very spectacular place. So if you're saying you're going to a land that's better than any other land at that time, you know, otherwise you're saying to you, I'm going to send you a really cool place, but trust me, it's going to be cool about 2000 years. You'll never see it. Book of Mormon will be over. Nobody will ever know. But after that time, sometime it'll be a really cool place. That's not a very good promise. You know, if the mm. Lord's going to promise something, it's going to mean something to the people. And at that time, this wasn't that cool of a place. So anyway, right. so Heartlander, what do they have going for them? Tradition and the tradition of the Hill Camorra. You, you can yes. anchor onto that. Past that, nothing works. You can think, try isn't there a scripture as well that talks about no uh, kings being upon the land? Oh, Sorry. yeah, everybody uses that one. Yeah, no kings upon the land. They, they, and I have no clue why they would do this because they don't understand history. Do they remember that before the United States broke off its colonies, that there was a king in the land? They had the king in England that was the king over this land. I mean, come on. Mm. This, these were colonies of another king. Um, there were kings all over. Uh, Maybe they might interpret it as he wasn't in the land. You know, he was still in England, but yeah, I know what you're, you know what you're trying say to say. That, but yeah, yeah. He, he was never in Ireland, claimed it as well, right? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the other thing is, they read it incorrectly. What it says is there will be no king who will rise up against you. So it doesn't say there won't be any kings here. It says you know, the other nations will not, you know, you'll be protected. People won't rise up against you if you're righteous. Hmm. So it has nothing to do with whether or not there's a king. There's been kings all over. Uh, somebody has ruled and called themselves a king. With the exception, I guess, of North America, where it was all tribes and nobody was ever a king, ever including during the time when Nephi is supposed to be a king and Benjamin's supposed to be a king. So when they say there were no kings upon the land, well, no kings except Lamanite kings. Lamanites had, or Nephi kings. Nephi right. had kings, but they don't count. It's misreading scripture for your own purposes, and we do that all the time. So mildly forgivable, but misreading nevertheless. So if you look at the heartland, you can always make any geography work. If you work hard enough at it, you can take a geography and say, I can make this work. And so they have made that geography work and they have maps and it'll say, this is where these lands work. Mm -hmm. But nothing really works that gets down into any kind of detail of, you know, how do you travel? How do you get from here, from there? Uh, the little details like Manti, everybody forgets Manti. Uh, Manti in the Book of Mormon is a critical city because it's built at the um, the most common passage from the land of Nephi to the land of Zarahemla, and most of the Nephite in, or Lamanite invasions come through this pass, come through where Manti is, and so Manti is built to be a defensive city and to defend this thing. And so people will put Manti on the map in a place where it's in in this plain or something where there's nothing around it. And so if you're an invading army, you don't have to go by Nephi. You just go somewhere else. You know, there's nothing else that restricts you to say, I've got to go by Nephi or by Manti. And so, you know, they, they miss the geography in Manti. Uh, Heartlanders have no good Manti. It's right at a place where the rivers take care of everything, but you still got to get across the river. Manti doesn't have any function. Um, do, the, do they label the, the River Sidon as the Mississippi River in yeah. the Heartland uh, yeah. model? I remember yeah. was it John Sorensen said that, that you can't. It's also the it's also the West Sea, depending on which one you need. Um, okay. Because yeah, everybody realizes you can't go to the Pacific. You know, they're trying to say that this all went to the Pacific would be really crazy. Uh, so yeah, their West Sea has to be the Mississippi, which is also the Sidon, which doesn't work. Is it possible but to wade across the Mississippi River? Because doesn't it talk about the, the armies going across the River Sidon? Yeah, the Book of Mormon? It, it does. It talks about that. Uh, the, interestingly enough, there is someone who looked at that uh, particular geography, and there is on the Grijalva River 
a particular place where there is a mountain in the right place and at certain times of year uh, when the water isn't flowing as heavily, you know, when it's getting into dry season, which is when you're going to do, bring your armies in anyway, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is a place where you can ford across that river. Now, can you ford the Mississippi? Anciently, there was a place where it wasn't terribly deep, but they're called the rapids. Well, um, rapids are called rapids because the water is moving kind of fast and it's not very safe to cross there. So it may not be very deep, but it's not very usable. Uh, if you're an army trying to get, you're going to spend a lot of energy just trying to get from one side to the other because it's trying to sweep you away. So yeah, there is a place on the Mississippi that might work, except it doesn't if you if you do more than look at the fact that it's it's not very deep. You know, if you look at what's happening there, uh, it doesn't work. Um, what really doesn't work is when you then say, okay, let's go look at you know culture. Um, one of the things that absolutely has to happen in order to give the populations that the Book of Mormon talks about is you have to have um, full-blown agriculture that can support a population. And in North America, you had incipient agriculture. So the people who were there did grow plants and they supplemented their, uh, diet, their diet with plants, but it was still heavily hunted. So you're kind of not hunters and gatherers anymore. You're sedentary, but you're in between because you can't grow enough crops that give you the calories you need. So you still have to hunt. And if you have to hunt, you have to have a territory. <clears throat> and that means two things. One, you have a relatively limited population. You can't grow very large because you can't feed the large population. And the other is you have to have people that are kind of far apart from each other because you can't have them uh, trying to compete for the same lands. And so archaeo you know, anthropologically, archaeologically, the way that we see the people that lived in North America, they're small tribals, they don't get very large, they're maybe at the largest 2,000 people in a location. Uh, that's usually enough to get a headman and maybe a chief, but never a king. You know, it's just not that level of organization. There's no indication of any higher... Uh, uh, well, religion, what indications we have of religion is it's shamanic. It, it's very nature bound uh, and appears to be, as most of them are, uh, enveloped in this, you know, specific individual rather than, uh, you know, a specific caste of people. You don't get, you know, a caste of priests. Um, you know, there's zero indication of writing. Um, they didn't have a writing system. No, no, uh, there, oh. there, there's no writing north of Mesoam the Mesoamerican region and south of the American, Mesoamerican region. There is no writing. There are no writing systems. Uh, so nobody was writing anything. No indication that there was ever writing there. Um, so right. the nature of the populations doesn't fit. The description, archaeological descriptions don't fit. Uh, the one that I find most difficult and, you know, the, the heartland people never, again, take time to explain. Uh, we talked about the Olmec and the Maya, and we said, okay, there's, you know, those two different cultural areas. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for looking at the, uh, the two as representative of the time period of the Book of Mormon is, you know, the Olmec were there at that time period, the time period is uh, later for the Maya. And we could talk more about that about Mesoamerica, but in in the Book of Mormon, the Jaredite culture never mixes with the the Maya. the The closest we get is we get Coriantumr who gets with the uh, the Mulekites, Mulekites, and then the Maya, you know, or the Nephites come in. But Nephites are never, you know, by the time the Nephites come and are anywhere close, they're dealing with a, a nation that's already been destroyed, and so there's no connection to them until they are pushed out of traditional lands and they go north of the narrow neck and now they're in and Mormon makes sure that we know that they're in Nephi or Jaredite territory because they're going to be destroyed. It's sort of like, yeah, you're in the land of desolation. Guess what? You're going to be destroyed. I mean, Mormon is very tight about how he writes these things. I mean, everything is presage. You, you, you know, it's coming because he's told you all along, but anyway, you have the same correlation of time period between the Adena and the Hopewell. The Adena are earlier, the Hopewell are later, the time periods match up for the Book of Mormon. 
And that's where most Heartlanders will leave it. What they don't mention is that the Hopewell are right where the Adena were. The Hopewell are on top of the Adena, which means that they built right where they were. And that's not what the Book of Mormon says. Book of Mormon never says, you know, the Nephites built right exactly where the Jaredites were. No, that's different land entirely. They were separate. Yeah, the connection between the Adena and the Hopewell is so tight now that modern archaeologists are beginning to say that the that calling Adena and Hopewell is a mislabeling labeling because it makes it sound like they're two different peoples. And it may be, you know, you pick one name or the other, say you take Hopewell, and now you have early Hopewell and later Hopewell. Uh, but, you know, there's a cultural difference there. But because they lived in the same place, you can't say that they were a different people. There's no indication there was conquest. There's no indication that anything changed. There's just a cultural change that happens with lots of places. And so that whole idea that there were two different people may be dissolved. But you don't hear that when the, the Heartlanders are talking about it. They just talk about the time periods. Um, so they really don't do archaeology very well. Uh, we, a couple of friends and I were talking to some of the Heartland leaders once, and my friend, after explaining things to them, said, look, here, here's the difference. You will look at, you in the Heartland will look at what the archaeologists say, and you'll say, well, we know they're wrong because of the Book of Mormon. He says, the people of Mesoamerica say, the archaeologists are right, and here's how that fits the Book of Mormon. That's two very different ways of looking at archaeology. Very different approaches, yeah. Very different approaches. And, and if you really look at what the archaeology that is used to support the Heartland theory, um, most of it is over by 1900. They, they use 1900 and before. Now, they use things from the Smithsonian, because that has a really good name. But this was prior to the time that there was... Um, scientific archaeology. So this is an earlier time period when people were making up crap as often as not. And so all of these things that that they're basing the connections on, uh, the modern archaeologists say, no, that's not true at all. But once the modern archaeologists say, well, that's not true at all, then they say, well, the modern archaeologists are wrong because this other stuff is right because that fits the Book of Mormon. So, you know, when you start saying that I'm right, regardless of who tells me I'm wrong, and the people who are telling you wrong are all of the experts. Um, you, You're you on shaky right. ground. Oh, I know of, uh, th there are zero archaeologists who believe in the Heartland Theory. Now, yeah. the, and, and obviously, I'm talking about LDS archaeologists, uh, because non-LDS archaeologists wouldn't believe the Book of Mormon the Book at all. Of Mormon, any, yeah. For Latter-day Saint archaeologists, I do not know of a single one who would accept the Heartland theory. I do know of several who accept the Mesoamerican theory. Yeah, and my understanding is the vast majority of faithful scholars, you know, believe in the Mesoamerican geography is the best fit for where the Book of Mormon most likely happened. You know, with uh, those looking at the have, scholarship. And, yeah, if you look at the training behind the people who are promoting these things. You know, what is the educational background? Now, the educational background doesn't always mean anything. Yeah, they could have uh, good arguments or evidence even without the expertise. However, but it's helpful to have yeah. it. Yeah, if, if you have people who are trained and now know how to look at these things and know what they're looking at, and they're the ones that are saying, I prefer this and not that, you should pay attention. You know, if you look at the people who are promoting the Heartland Theory, you do not have anthropologists. You do not have archaeologists. You do not have historians. You have armchair historians who don't have the background. And yeah, depending on who you're talking about, sometimes some pretty uh, tenuous background. Uh, one, one of the worst things that the Heartland has done for people is promote what are known to be hoaxes. Uh, they will take falsified artifacts and say, this proves the Book of Mormon. It's a fake. Oh, wow. you know, we know that they're fakes, but they keep getting promoted because it looks like it should promote the Book of Mormon. But they're fakes. You know, why, why do you do that? Why do you say that? You know, I know I was looking at one guy who said, yeah, there's, there's metal swords in the Heartland area. 
And I saw pictures of them. I'm going, yeah, that's that's a modern fake. I can tell from the picture that that's a modern fake. Um, that's very misleading. Yeah, I mean, when you start using fakes as your demonstration, I, I'm leery of everything else you say. Right. A, a couple of points that I noted is the Book of Mormon doesn't speak about snow, but it talks about the the battles, the warfare happening, you know, in, in winter time. And surely if it happens sort of like in the Great Lakes region, there would be snow um, if they're having battles at winter time, but there's no mention of snow. Yeah. Yeah. I the, the, You have to understand that I'm one of the more careful people in that I don't want to accept every argument that's been made. The argument about battles in winter time that imposes winter on you know the winter season, a four season onto the wet and dry season that we see in the Book of Mormon. Right. So I don't know that you would necessarily call it winter, but it's absolutely certain that there is no indication that winter ever affects anyone in the Book of Mormon. Now, I lived in the New York area for 18 years, and uh, there is no way that you go through that time period without being affected by snow. You, you're going to mention that, oh, man, the snow ruined the crops this year. Uh, I remember a couple of snowfalls that came late in the year. So all of the trees have leafed out and we get a heavy wet snow and there's branches breaking all over the place. And it's just, it's, it's a mess. Well, if you've got crops out there and you know, that's going to come and destroy the crops, you've got a problem. Yeah. The fact that you could go through the Northeast and never mention snow does not sit well with anybody who's ever lived in the Northeast. And what about, you know, we talk about the destruction in third Nephi and there's a good candidate for a volcano responsible for the volcanic eruption and geological activity. Is there any candidate that they have in, in their model that would fit to the right time? There, there was a, they call it the Madrid earthquake. There was a Madrid earthquake that it was a very massive earthquake and caused a lot of noise. And I think maybe some fog or something uh, up on the river. Uh, so they're using that. And you remember what I said about parallels and convergences? That's a parallel. They'll take the fact that there was an earthquake uh, and that it had some of these things and they'll say, that's my candidate. But it doesn't fit all of them. It doesn't fit the, uh, the, the lightning strikes. And you know, there's several things that it misses. And mm. the other Duncan thing that cities. I remember Jerry Grover saying is, the, the major thing that you have to realize is that what the Book of Mormon describes cannot be an earthquake. And we go, oh, well, we're talking about the earthquake and shaking. He says, yeah, but it, in the Book of Mormon, it does it for a long time. He says, earthquakes don't last long. He said, if it's an earthquake, it's going to shake it, but it's a minute or two at most. You might have an aftershock that comes later. So the earthquakes don't last. So yeah, you can have a massive earthquake and it can be terrible, but it's not going to last for hours and hours and days and days like it does in the Book of Mormon. Now, if you have an erupting volcano that's consistently erupting and therefore altering um, the, the geographic plates around it, yeah, that's going to happen. So you really need a volcano and it really doesn't work. And you remember I said that if you're the only actual geologists who have looked at this require a volcano. So yeah. anything else is somebody saying, I'm looking for a parallel, I'll take any one I find. Uh, but does it fit? Not really. That's interesting what he says about the geological, you know, ac activity, the volcanic eruptions, you know, in that area fits quite well with John Sorensen's geographical model mm -hmm. as well. So we're like uh, supportive, uh, someone who's oh, yeah. an expert in this field. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I thought of another one where the, the people who look at the heartland forget to mention it. Uh, the Book of Mormon is very specific about the north, uh, the land northward. So it's not Nephite land and the land northward of, and it has to be northward of the narrow neck. And, uh, and you have to go to a land of many waters, which is the Great Lakes, right? So that works. Mm -hmm. But then they have to go to concrete and they have to have a large population there. Well, the uh, ancient Canada uh, did not have large populations. There was a lot of water there. And, um, you know, they had some, you know, hard brick, you know, hard, hardened area, um, but, you know, nothing that was, you know, really cement. What they really didn't have were cities built out of cement. 
and you know places that we can find and large populations, which is never there. Um, the all the other thing is frequently the narrow neck of land is a is a neck of land between a couple of the Great Lakes and Buffalo. And what they ironically miss is that the, the Hill Cumorah is north of the narrow neck. And if that's their narrow neck, they have the Hill Cumorah southeast of the narrow neck, which is completely wrong for what the Book of Mormon says. Oh, okay. And that doesn't the Hill work. Cumorah has to be above the narrow neck of land. So again, what happens in the heartland is you find a few things. You find parallels. You find a two or three things where you say, yeah, I can make this fit, I can make that fit, I can make that fit. And then you can throw other theology and nationality, uh, you know, on top of that mix and stir and set. And you have a, a theory. But when you get into the details, it doesn't work very well. Mm. Now, go into the kinds of things we were talking about in the Book of Mormon. Um, the simple thing of explaining Limhi's expedition and how they missed Zarahemla. Okay, you get on the Mississippi River, and first of all, it's hard to mistake the Mississippi for anything else. And secondly, if you're traveling on the Mississippi, how are you going to miss this thing? Uh, you, you can't explain that story in the heartland. But they don't try to. That's not their purpose. They really don't want to explain the Book of Mormon. Uh, there is a, a theory. They like the theory. It fits, and uh, you, you just don't press it very hard. You don't work very hard to see you know, if things fit, and it never helps the Book of Mormon. You can never take that theory, put it behind the Book of Mormon, and say, oh, that helps me understand the Book of Mormon. Yeah, it, it never does any of that, all of which we get in, in Mesoamerica, which obviously is the reason why I lean to that model. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of specificity as we talk through it, things which um, seem to align well with geography, time periods, the culture, uh, people's yeah, being yeah. there at the right time, which are important things. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, bash on people who hold a different geographical model, but I think it's important to look at the the strengths and weaknesses of both, you know, the arguments for, the arguments against, and particularly to understand, you know, the scholarly consensus, you know, among, you know, faithful scholars, you know, where do they lean? Not that that means it's necessarily right, but you tend to want to follow with the experts and uh, wh where they think the best evidence points to. So, but people should, you know, check out the the evidence and arguments for the Heartland theory, but also look at the arguments against that you've presented as well. Um, and I think people should, I'll hold up the book again, give this uh, a serious look in the Book of Mormonist history and go more in depth at the different convergences that we've gone through. So final last couple of questions before we start for part one. Um, we kind of touched on this earlier. Um First of all, what do you think other Mesoamerican scholars would think of your book? Have any of them read them who aren't LDS? Because you, you tend to quote a lot of scholarship to support, so it's not just you stretching things. But what do you think they would think of this? Would they think that you're kind of like stretching things or you're, you, you know, you're trying to put a square peg through a round hole? Um, have you had any experience talking to any non-LDS uh, yeah, scholars? Um... Absolute none. Uh, no experience. I, I don't think any of them have read it. I don't think any of them want to. Uh, I, I think if someone handed that and say, here, what's your opinion? They'd say, I don't have time for that. Um, right. They'd always be yeah. a bit dismissive of it. Yeah. I mean, if they did read it, they could say, oh, OK, I can see why you say that. I still don't believe it. But I, you know. Um, so yeah, I think from that standpoint, were they to read it, they'd have to say, well, okay, yeah, I can, I can see where you're doing that. I still don't believe it. That's kind of what I think would happen. Okay. What do you make of Michael Coe, who I believe he did read the Book of Mormon? Uh, yeah. You know, he'd been interviewed on, I think, Mormon stories, maybe elsewhere. Yeah. And, you know, he's laid out sort of 
the reasons why he doesn't think it fits with Mesoamerica. Uh, why why do you think he doesn't see the the convergences that you list in in the book? I know he's not uh, alive anymore. It, yeah, I mean, part of it is the is his age, yeah, and I don't mean that to say because he was saying that when he was old. I mean it to say that when he read the Book of Mormon and talked to John Sorensen and talked to people about the Book of Mormon, it was a different world. Uh, it was a different age and a different way of explaining the Book of Mormon. So what Coe's vision of the Book of Mormon was is much more consonant with the way we did, would have described it in 60s and 70s. Uh, and, and it was changing by the 70s, but I think he wrote his article in 70 and you know, obviously never changed his mind since. Um, but Coe's understanding of the text was first of all, very literal. And secondly, he had a, a big bone to pick with the idea that the Nephites started civilization because he knew that wasn't true. Well, he was right. Uh, and you know, to the degree that he thought that that's what the Book of Mormon required, of course he wouldn't believe in the Book of Mormon because he knows that that's not correct. I think so that's sort of like the narrative that, we were presenting traditionally, weren't we? So you know, we have sort of reinterpreted it, and some people would say, you know, uh, massaged our position, but you know, I, I think it's a much more sophisticated understanding, just like we've had to have a much more sophisticated understanding of the Old and New Testament, when you start putting real history behind it, you have to jettison some of the ideas that, you know, developed before you had the evidence. Um, so I think basically I understand where Coe's coming from. It's a very literalist uh, reading of it where a horse is a horse and I've never found a horse. Um, you know, and, and frankly, the biggest one, which is I know Nephites didn't start all this. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think was happening with Coe. I know where it was coming from. I know what the time period was. And all of those, I think, are, are I would make the same arguments against an LDS apologist from the 60s and maybe early 70s who was trying to make those same arguments today. I'd, I'd probably be very much like Coe. Right. And would you say for some of those like non-LDS archaeologists who are obviously experts in their field in archaeology and Mesoamerican culture, but they maybe wouldn't be um, experts in the, the text of the Book of Mormon and know sort of like all those intricate details that you you touched on in the book that, that seemed to correlate because they, they wouldn't have the expertise in the Book of Mormon. Yes, they have expertise in archaeology, uh, but they may not be aware of the things which right. might align or converge. Yeah, and, and you know, the vast majority of Latter-day Saints who read the Book of Mormon don't have that kind of expertise in the text because we don't read it that way. Um, I, I know many people who have read the Book of Mormon hundreds of times, but never noticed any cultural information in it. Yeah, uh, you know, they, because you read it for spiritual information. Anything else, your eyes glaze over. Yep, I read that. Yeah, um, your your book or, totally or opened like my eyes to so many go, things. Did I read that, or was I asleep when I was reading that? Or, you know. Um, yeah, when when you quote in the book about uh, Nephi being upon the little tar in the garden. I almost I, I went and checked the scripture because I was almost like I I don't think I've ever read that before. Are you making it up? And then I read it. I was like, and I probably just gloss gloss over it. Like it's it's of brought course, like yeah. so many things that we pass over these things. Mm -hmm. If you don't read it looking for that kind of information, you miss it. Um, some of the work that I've been doing more recently, you know, has been looking at um, you know archaeology in the Book of Mormon. It's just been looking at the way the Book of Mormon was written. How does Nephi write? How does Mormon write? And most particularly Mormon lately. But I've been crawling through all kinds of corners of the Book of Mormon to look at the way Mormon wrote, and I'm seeing things that Mormon that is very clear to me that Mormon did intentionally. I've never seen before. I've, I've spent 30, the last 30 years of my life looking at the Book of Mormon, and I missed these things. And now that I see them, I'm going, dang, that's obvious. I don't know how we missed that. Um, but we do because we don't read it looking for those things. So yeah, for an R non LDS person to go through the Book of Mormon and find it, it would be shocking if they came up with those conclusions, they'd have to spend the time to say, okay, yeah, let's, you know, what does this gardener say? What is Kerry Hall saying? Or what is Mark Wright written about? Um, John Sorensen was um, a pioneer and wrote a lot of really good things and sets the stage for us. But quite a few things that are in 
what Sorensen wrote, I, I think has been superseded and we need to you know, kind of move to, to the next generation, uh, which I don't think he would be terribly unhappy with. I remember Hugh Nibley saying famously that he, he says, I don't, I won't stand by anything I wrote 10 years ago. Hmm. So yeah, yeah scholarship's Nibley, always advancing. Yeah, scholarship changes. And, you know, what you wrote 10 years ago may not hold up. And, uh, you know, some of the things that I wrote about are now getting to be 20 years old. And uh, I cross my fingers, I'd say 90% of them are still holding up. There's yeah. a few of them where I'm saying, yeah, I missed that. You know, my, my opinion now would be very different now, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years later. Um, so you've got to keep up on the scholarship or else you don't know what's happening now. And even the same person, you know, reading something I wrote 30 years ago, not at all what I'm going to say today. Right. Like yeah. I remember something I posted 30 years ago and I'm looking at it and saying, yeah, I'm glad I took that down. <laughs> And I even have some similarities between maybe some of the early YouTube videos I did compared to now. I look back at them, I'm like, oh, I wish it. I, yeah, I don't yeah, feel yeah. the same now, or I know a lot more on the topic. And yeah, yeah. yeah, it's normal for people's views to change with, yeah. Yeah. They learn more, research yeah. more. Um, one last question before you wrap up. There's going to be some people who are going to be listening who, you know, they're maybe not believers. They don't believe in Book of Mormon historicity, authenticity. And they might see it as, okay, you're pointing out some interesting correlations. They might even say these are just parallels, but they might say there's just, there's no definitive archaeological evidence unless like a non-LDS archaeologist can verify the Book of Mormon's historicity. Uh, I'm not persuaded by any of the convergences that you say. Uh, do you have any response to someone who would think like that? There's probably nothing you could say that would change their mind, but once, once you have set a condition that you know cannot be uh, fulfilled, you really aren't going to change your mind uh, and, until some really spectacular thing happens. You know, I am not going to believe this unless the sun turns red. You know, okay. Yeah, I can't convince you unless the sun turns red, and I don't think that's going to happen. So, uh, yeah, once they've made that statement, then they're not open to understanding. They're, they're making an assumption that you, know, you can't have a legitimate argument if you are LDS. So yeah, once you've decided that, you're, you're not open to understanding. You have to at least allow for the fact that somebody who's LDS might know something mm -hmm. uh, and then go read that. But if you're not willing to do that, you've made a decision and you can't do anything about it. I'm not going to convince you. Yeah. I mean, the Book of Mormon has been out there to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ for, you know, a couple hundred years now. And uh, there are a lot of people that don't believe it. So you, you have to have it. The, the Book of Mormon is really good in that it talks about a particle of faith. Uh, when Alma's story is talking about how faith develops, he talks about a particle of faith. And he says, what is a far particle of faith? You have to have the desire to believe. If you do not exercise a particle of faith, you don't go anywhere. You have to have at least a desire to believe. And how big does that desire have to be? Not much. But in the case of someone who says, you know, I won't believe it until a non-LDS archaeologist tells me, there's no desire to believe there at all. Yeah. Now, if they said, I won't believe it until I've gone through the arguments and compared them to what non-LDS you know, non archaeologists say, you know, if I'm really going to get in, I now have a desire to believe and I'm going to do some work to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, it's the shortcut. I, yeah, I'm not going to believe until somebody else says so. And then I don't have to worry about it because I know the other person isn't going to say so. So it's simple. Um, yeah, yeah, desire to believe is more difficult. It's a more difficult path. And I remember whenever I, because I, I went through a faith crisis and I, I, I lost belief and stepped away from church for a while. And there's experiences that brought me back. But I remember whenever I really looked at some of the, the faithful evidences, whenever I looked at, uh, for example, old world geography and, you know, NHM on an altar is kind of like scoffed by critics. It's just kind of like a coincidence and, you know, apologists are making more of a big deal of it. But whenever I looked at how well it correlated, you know, Lehi's travel through the Arabian desert, you talk about, you know, the broken bow and how that would fit them changing to more desert, our climate, you know, the, the wood like twisting and then he'd have to make a new bow and 
and arrows and then they're coming to a place which was called Nahum. They're call calling all these places. They find like a, an altar and like a burial site that dates to the right time. It's in the right location. They buried Ishmael there. Uh, I believe the name Ishmael has been found, but there's, I don't think anywhere you could verify it's the right Ishmael. You know, there's no vials in, in Hebrew or in the Semitic script that they had. And I believe Nahum in Hebrew means to mourn. It says that the daughter of Ishmael did mourn over Ishmael. Uh, so it could be like a Hebrew pun and then how they travel like southeast or eastward towards Bountiful. And there's a good candidate, you know, that has the right descriptions. I don't know whenever I looked at it, I kind of thought like, OK, it kind of converges, but uh, it, it could still be a coincidence. It, it's, it's not proof. But then I kind of thought to myself, well, what would I expect realistically to be better? Like archaeological evidence for if it historically happened, would I expect, you know, to say Nephi was here? And I think I had to look at it sort of realistically as well. Like, I think if you compare maybe to some things in biblical archaeology, it actually, it fits quite well. Uh, and people have to decide if they think it's a strong enough convergence to have faith or if it's all just coincidence or uh, parallels. But it's it, to me, yeah. it seems quite unlikely that Joe Smith could have, that it correlates so well with the Book of Mormon text, but he wouldn't have had that knowledge of uh, ancient Arabia. Yeah, um, the thing about archaeology and the Book of Mormon is that what you would expect of a text written in 1830, which is prior to the time when most of this archaeology was even begun, uh, this is even a time prior to scientific archaeology, what you would expect for a text written that says it describes history that was written in 1830, is that the longer you go with history, with archaeology, the worse that text would get. The more things would crop up, say, yeah, no, but that was weird. Nope, that doesn't fit. Yeah, for all to be more diverse. obvious over time. It should have fit its time period. But once the time period of creation was over and you start getting more information to learn about what that history was, take any history that was written at any time period and you will start finding how, you know, find out that later research invalidates parts of that history because we learn more, we know more. And so if this were a text written in 1830, it should have, frankly, it should have been debunked a long time ago. Mm. Uh, nothing should fit. We shouldn't find any archaeology that matches up. The fact has been that the more we have found, the better the fit has become. And that is totally unexpected. Uh, in the trajectory of, of what would have happened with a 1830 document, unless how somehow it was actually a real document that was translated. So if it's an actual ancient document, it should work. If it's a document from 1830, it should have fallen apart within 100 years. Yeah, I think this is a good place to, to start for part one, but we sort of laid um, a case talking about the convergences, the things that fit between the Book of Mormon, and Mesoamerica, geography, mind culture, you know, history, time, location. Um, and in the next part, we're going to take a break and we're going to do part two. Um, we're going to be talking about sort of your theory for how the Book of Mormon was translated. Because um, if, the, if the book has historicity, uh, then understanding the translation, even if there's, say, 19th century elements, you know, phraseology, vocabulary, if it has historicity, then those things may be interpreted through how was it translated and understanding the nature of translation uh, and a lot of criticisms against the book of mormon tend to be to do with the the translation and things in the text uh, so we'll talk about that more uh in part two but one last um promotion for your book by uh his book the book of mormon as history uh tradition of the fathers it's a great read and um, we'll see you on part two uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about book of mormon translation uh thanks everyone for watching please like share and subscribe to my channel and check out part two. Thanks, Brent. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can via my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mormonism with the Murph.
take care. Bye-bye.